let's see. Uh, I'll hand it over to Jim here in a second. Um, I think if you have any questions or any anything you want to talk to Jim about, um, feel free to ask us at any time. We're going to feed him those questions at the end of the stream, um, and he'll answer them on the stream. So, um, Jim, go ahead. Tell everybody tell everybody why you look like you're you're in the shadows here. <laughs> sure. <laughs> thanks for being here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Thomas, and and thanks, Zach, for having me over on your meetup. Um, so yeah, right now I'm actually in Framingham, Massachusetts, which is right outside of Boston. And we had a storm come through and we lost power. So uh, we're doing the meetup tonight uh, for, by candlelight and um, tethering our phones. So if we do blank out, uh, I apologize. It's possible that we lost battery to something, but I'm hoping that we have enough juice to get through it and hopefully get to a point where I can answer some of your questions. So I'm just going to hop right in and get started here unless there's anything else that needs to be said before I do that. Good to go. Okay. Let's see here. Can you all see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. So tonight I'm going to be talking about this framework called Plenty. And we've kind of put this cheeky tagline here. It's the JavaScript framework for people who don't like JavaScript all that much. And, um, you know, adding a co controversial tagline like that is just basically a, a gimmick to get a little more attention. But I'll explain a little bit what it means. It's not completely just a gimmick. It um, kind of speaks to the methodology that we're using to build some of this stuff. Now, I'm the primary developer on this. It's really just uh, a pet project that I've been working on. I have I started working on it pretty heavily in January and I've um, worked on it steadily up until this point and I plan on continuing working on it. Um, and you might be surprised, well, you, you've only accomplished that in this amount of time and uh, I'm a little surprised myself. It's a lot of work building these things. So it gives me a lot more respect for all the people who've done other projects and, and larger projects as well. But I'll give a little insight into what we're doing over here. So what is Plenty? So like Thomas said, Plenty is a static site generator. It's open source. Uh, you can find the GitHub URL there. And basically it has a Go backend and a Svelte front end. And those two technologies aren't really set up to integrate too well together. So we had to do some pretty interesting things to make them mesh. Right now Go is building a lot of site scaffolding and things on the back end. And Svelte is the front end component library um, that gives you a reactive front end. You might be asking, well, why is there so much JS shade? Like, why, why are we kind of, um, you know, bringing down the ecosystem of JavaScript? And I, it's really not my intention. I just want to talk a little bit about how I'm approaching this. So, I am trying to steer this project with the idea that nobody's going to praise you for the complexity of your comp your code, but they're going to judge you by what you shipped. And basically, I kept finding myself in these situations, whether it's with my own consulting business, which I do a lot of the work primarily as a developer on that, or some other larger projects I've worked on with other teams is sometimes different frameworks and things like that can actually get in your way and prevent you from being productive. Now, that doesn't mean that that's always the case. So here's a page with a bunch of projects on it. Now, these projects are great, and I don't want to disparage any of these projects. I, I use these a lot, and they can make you insanely productive in, in everything. Sometimes there are projects that don't warrant all this complexity, and when you cobble a lot of things together, they can slow you down, especially when your team is reliant on your, you know, your most junior member of your team. So a lot of times, if you find that junior folks are spending 50% of the time or close to it, which sounds absurd, but it can happen, configuring these things and not actually doing productive work on either client work or um, whatever the deliverable is, you might want to step back and evaluate your process and say, do we really need all these tools? Is there a way to do this with less configuration and a more of a consistent experience? So that's something that I was interested in and I was thinking about a lot when I was embarking on this project and I really wanted to smooth out some of the edges to make this whole process seamless for someone who wanted to use some modern technology like Svelte and wanted to use it in a really consistent way, uh, even if it is a little bit simplified and can't really be probably quite as extensible as some other frameworks, but if you really want a, a small um, use case done really quickly, I think Plenty might be a good option for you. So. I'm going to basically divide this into a couple different tracks here and hopefully do a little demo in between. So this is uh, starting with where we are. So what is Plenty today? We're going to talk a little bit about how Svelte is integrated with it. We'll talk a little bit about what Go is doing in the project. Do a little quick demo there just to show some different things off depending on time. And then I want to talk about some things we're doing in the near future and get some input from the community. And uh, hopefully when you're asking your questions, you can give me your opinions as well, as well on things like themes and the Git CMS, which is 
one of the fundamental goals that I had when I started the project, although there's still a fair amount of work that has to be done in order to implement this, but it's something I want to discuss with everybody. And then finally, just talking about the way distant future about microservices and either integrating existing things or potentially building out our own stuff in the future. So I definitely want to get some input from you all on that as well. So this is where we are right now. We have a Svelte front end. Now, I want to talk a little bit about just the theory behind some of this stuff. So uh, I used to design a lot of websites with CMS technology. I actually still do a lot of work in Drupal and WordPress and things like that. And a lot of those frameworks, they don't force you to kind of think at the component level. They, a lot of times they want you to just think at like a page or a template level. And I really think changing my shift or shifting my mindset over to thinking about components was really helpful. So this whole idea of atomic design, building out components from smaller items to larger components that can be reused. And frameworks like React and Vue and even Svelte, they force you to think in this general sort of way. So having this as a mental model has really helped for my projects. And I think having a framework like Plenty that enforces this right at the fundamental level is really helpful for things like scoping and just uh, scope creep and all sorts of different things like that. Um, to limit what you're doing and have a better understanding of all the different aspects that make up your site. So I want to have this kind of locked up here so as we're thinking about this project. And then component libraries, we, we all probably know at this point like how great they can be. So they can increase the flexibility and consistency of your design and make aspects reasonable across your site. So uh, they force you to kind of build things in a certain way uh, and they also can add a lot of interactivity to your site. So if you need um, like a really dynamic front end, uh, a project like Svelte will really help out with that a lot. Now, why did I choose Svelte over uh, a project like React or Vue that is definitely more well-supported and just more robust in terms of uh, community contributions? Now, I had looked at Svelte a while back and then it kind of fell off my radar for a while. And then one of my colleagues on a project I was working on mentioned that they were interested in trying Svelte and um, I respected their technical uh, decisions and uh, thought they were really good React developers. So it sparked me to think, okay, maybe this is worth a second look. So I went and I found this video from Rich Harris, who's the creator of Svelte, uh, about rethinking reactivity. I was really intrigued by the arguments that were put forth in the video. And then I dove a little bit into some tutorials and just playing around on my local environment. And I quickly fell in love with Svelte because I thought it was doing a lot of things right. It was definitely bringing a simplified model to how to approach some of this stuff. And uh, I really I really dug it. So although I had actually started Plenty a while back on React, I ended up changing it over to Svelte because uh, the whole idea was to make things as simple as possible. And I thought this was going to get me there a lot faster than um, something like React might. So Svelte actually uses this HTMLX templating language. And this is a project that has been abstracted that I, I believe Rich wants uh, folks to use on other frameworks. Um, it's basically the syntax language and then Svelte's doing some things to interpret that on the back end, but it offers a lot of really nice things. So we're doing single page components. Uh, basically, you can break up files uh, into individual files and then that lives at its own component level. And you don't really have to worry about things like fragments. So if you're familiar with some other languages, you, you kind of have to wrap things in a single uh, base layer, but you can have many layers of HTML all at the same level in a single page component and Svelte will take care of that for you. You don't really have to worry about those kind of things. The syntax is really simplified. When I write Svelte, uh, even though it's HTMLX, I feel like I'm writing regular HTML and JavaScript and style uh, CSS code. And it's all in one file that gets scoped together and it's really nice to work with. So it really reduces the cognitive load I have when I'm building websites. There's also a lot less boilerplate. So when you're defining things like variables, you feel like you're just defining it in the regular way you would with any kind of JavaScript um, uh, code. And you can bind things really easily. And uh, it seems, and there's probably a lot of controversy of this, but you always see people who are promoting different frameworks showing like a snippet of something and then a snippet of the same thing in a different language. And um, it seems to me that a lot of times felt is uh, shorter uh, in terms of the boilerplate that's needed to do something. But of course that could be a little bit of bias because I'm, I'm plugged into a lot of Svelte communities and, and you're always going to promote something that makes Svelte look like it's in a positive light. But I do think that there might be something to it being pretty um, concise. I also really like the fact that CSS is scoped out of the box of Svelte. So if you're in your single page component, you can basically add a style tag like you would if you were just putting that in line with your CSS. 
and then it stays scoped with those components. So if you were to style just a regular component without even using an ID or something like that, you can scope it to it. Uh, you can still do global scoping, so you're not limited to just scoping CSS because there are times where you want to apply things globally, but it gives you a really nice interface right out of the box without having to configure anything. It also has concepts like built-in stores, so you can do writable stores without having to pull anything like Redux or other libraries, so it just kind of works out of the box. And the default starter that we have set up in Plenty has a little example just to show how to do this, and I can go through that in a second just to show folks what I'm talking about. So I think, you know, Svelte is really great on its own, but I think Plenty takes it to the next level. So we're doing a lot of unique things to make things even simpler. Uh, so we're cutting out the bundlers. We started with Rollup, which is commonly used at Svelte, and moved over to ES Build, which is a Go project that compile or does bundling really, really fast. And then eventually moved on to some other projects, which I'll discuss in a second. And But we're not using a bundler at all anymore. Um, we're using the, the ESM imports. And the way that we have it set up now is we actually don't even require internet access to get started, which is kind of unique for someone who's coming from NPM and the world where you're, you're pulling in a lot of uh, packages that uh, are being pulled from the internet. The builds are really fast. So out of the box, the, uh, the starter should take about a half a second to compile. Although I think we're going to try to make that a lot faster because Go has a really great concurrency model and we haven't really even dove too deep into it. We started with some concurrency in there, and then we have re-architected the project several different times to change the overall method of how we're doing things, and we ha haven't gone back and really re-architected it to add concurrency back in. So I think we're gonna get that number down a lot faster. Also, third-party dependencies are optional. We include everything that is needed out of the box, so you don't need to install anything else besides Plenty to get going, but you can always extend it because we don't wanna limit people to just be stuck with the, the starter that we have. And there's not a lot of configuration overload. There's a, uh, a plenty.json file, which is a config file that you can add some things in there. But right now it's pretty limited, even in terms of what we offer with it. Um, but also you don't have to do a lot to just get started. I, I'm hoping that it feels like you download it and you basically start a site and you can really start editing things without um, worrying about rigging things up and connecting data sources to layouts and figure out routing and all those things. That's all basically taking, for, taking care of you, uh, uh, taking care of for you, sorry, uh, and um, should just kind of work. So when I talked about the bundler, so the first thing we did when we cut out the bundlers is we needed a way to uh, basically make NPM packages and things that our people are doing in the project work with uh, ESM import syntax. So we started with Snowpack and Snowpack's a really great project and uh, it's much more robust than what we moved to, but it was a little slow for our purposes. So it was taking about a second to run and about half of a second was actually Snowpack doing its work. And then another half was a delay because we were doing this execution of a third-party script from Go. So you use this exec.command uh, method. And it had about a half second delay. So that was really slowing things down. Um, even though a second sounds like it's really fast, maybe if you compare it to some other um, JavaScript frameworks. But since we're, we're, we're going in a different direction with this, trying to really make the builds fast and consistent, it was just too slow for our purposes. Also, it pulled in about 184 third-party dependencies, so NPM packages, just to run Snowpack. And it seemed like a lot of things that I didn't really want to manage, especially since I'm primarily taking care of this project myself. I wanted to have a really slim and small uh, starting point for uh, the project. So I moved over and I built my own little sub-project inside of Plenty called GoPack. And it basically does some of the things that Snowpack does, but in a lot less intelligent way. So I never want to sit here and pretend like we're a competitor in any way to Snowpack. Snowpack is much more robust uh, and can extend farther than GoPack can. But for our default starter and some of the basic tests that I've done, GoPack fits our purposes. So it cuts down on the time a significant amount. It went from about a second to about 10 milliseconds. We possibly can get it faster than that and it doesn't require any third party, uh, third party dependencies. So it made things a lot more simple uh, to manage. Okay, so going on to the Go side of things. So why did we choose Go in the first place? This is more just my mental model than any really concrete evidence of why we should have used Go, but it had a really strong microsystem, uh, microservice ecosystem. So Netlify, which is the one of the premier hosts in the Jamstack space, has this section on their website called Open Source. And uh, it basically has a bunch of microservices, things like e-commerce and authentication, and they're all built in Go. So Go seems like a really good choice for these types of microservices. And then Go was actually really easy to pick up. So I had never used Go before starting this project. 
And I started by looking at this video, this video series here from CentDesk. And uh, it was just like learning the Go syntax and starting a project. I actually didn't even finish it, but it was really quick to pick up. And Go is really limited in scope in terms of what it tries to do. So I found like it, I found it to be a really productive language right off the bat. And I, it really just uh, fit with what I was trying to do here. And then the other thing about it that was great is it has really fast performance and a good concurrency model. So uh, one of the primary things I wanted to do with this project was to make the builds really fast based on what I'll talk about a little later in this presentation. So uh, I, I thought it was a, a good uh, choice, especially after looking at stuff like Hugo, which compile extremely fast, uh, much faster than Plenty does at this point. I also really like that it's a compiled language, so you actually end up deploying this single binary instead of an interpreter language like PHP or JavaScript where you actually have to have a runtime on your computer. So this simplifies things a fair amount because no longer are your users worrying about setting up a programming language and making sure the versions are right and then potentially doing package management and everything. They really just have to download a binary and then things just work out of the box. So that makes the process a lot easier uh, to set up. It makes it a lot more consistent, I'm hoping, um, although we changed the API a fair amount right now because we're in heavy development. But um, assuming we get to a stable uh, 1.0 release, then um, it should make things a lot more consistent for folks. And it's really easy to install. So we have this project uh, Go releaser that we pulled in um, that basically sets up a lot of uh, different package management solutions. So you can install plenty on Homebrew. You can install it on Snapcraft. You, uh, you can used to be able to install it on Scoop, which is the Windows package manager. But with a couple of new things we've done, we've broke Windows support for the time being. We hope to add it back in. Uh, but you can check out an older version if you want. And then we also uh, have a Docker Hub official image setup. So if you want to use this with your CI builds, you can just pull in our image, which is basically a scratch container with a binary of, of the Plenty project on it. So um, you can deploy your own sites using that image if you want. And then the thing that really makes this unique is Node.js and NPM are optional. And the way we do that is we pulled in this V8 Go project, and it's basically pulling in a compiled version of the V8 engine, which uh, is part of the Chromium project. It's using a lot of different JavaScript uh, languages. I think Node.js actually even uses it. And basically what we're doing is we're hitting that V8 directly in Go, and we no longer require that you have Node.js installed on your computer at all. You don't even need to use NPM to install anything. We include some of that stuff by default. Now, we're not saying you can't use these projects. You can actually still use these, but they're optional. Uh, so you might want to use those to extend things. And so that kind of gets into overriding defaults. You can override things if you want. Uh, the first concept here is a little separate from that. So we have an ejectable core. And basically, if you want to customize routing or props or things that we set up behind the scenes for you, you can eject part of the core. So it's actually hidden from the user, so you're not overloaded with things. Um, but if you eject, uh, we basically give you some warnings about whether you've already ejected these files and they have changes to them, or the fact that you are no longer going to get automatic updates from us. So right now, if you were to just update your version of Plenty by inst you know pulling a new version, you don't have to go and update all your individual projects. They just will automatically adhere to the new core unless you've ejected them and you've made modifications. At that point, then you're on your own. You can also still use NPM, so you can upgrade packages. Uh, right now, we've since we're pulling a lot of the stuff into Go itself and putting it in the binary, we are manually taking care of packages. And anyone who's relied on projects that have to do that, they know that they typically fall behind, especially when they're developed by someone who's a single developer like me for the most part. Uh, so if you find that we're falling behind, you can still get the newest versions by updating themselves, or you can add new versions. Um, so NPM is still an option that you can use to extend your projects. And we still have a separated build process. So we have the V8 Go build, which is where I'm trying to move things in the future. And then we also have an optional Node.js build, which is the old build. And you can actually still uh, eject the Node.js build, use your local Node.js version, and change that build process if you wanted to. I'm still up in the air about how tenable it will be for me to maintain both those builds because it obviously slows down my pace of development. So at some point I may deprecate that, but that's to be determined. Okay, so now we're on to the demo. I was hoping to show a, a little bit about just like how Plenty is set up. Uh, we've been, I've been talking for about 20 minutes now. I don't know, it, are you guys usually shooting for like 30 to 45 minutes for talks? Yeah, that's great. I mean. Um, we don't have anybody after you today, so I mean, you're welcome to go up to 45 or so. Um, okay, yeah. perfect. So I'll show a couple of things here. Um, and then, you know, I, I think for me, the most useful thing is any conversation that people want to have. So I, I won't try to be too long-winded, but let me just open up a new Plenty Projects and see if we can 
uh, get something like this going. So I'm going to go to my desktop. And so Plenty is basically a command line tool if you haven't installed. So you basically prepend your commands with Plenty. Um, if you were to just type the Plenty keyword, you can see some available commands, some flags, and some help information there. Uh, basically, if we want to create a new project, we would say new site, and we can call this jamdemv. And that creates the scaffolding. It creates it that quick. And then we can go inside our new project. And let me actually just open this up in a text editor. So I think this will be a little easier for folks to follow along. I do a lot of things on the terminal, um, but sometimes I think that confuses folks. So this is, can you see my VS code that's open here? Does that look okay? Yep, yep. can. Everything's good. Great. So this is the, the basic project structure. It starts really simple. So this is the default starter. So this will give you a little bit of a website out of the box. We actually do have this concept of passing a bear flag, so hyphen hyphen bear, and that will create a project for you without some of these defaults in case you're a heavy user of Plenty and you create sites all the time and you want them to be custom and you don't want some of this boilerplate, you can always pass that flag. But for people who are looking at this for the first time, it might be helpful to start with a starter that just comes by default and it'll create some of these things for you. So first thing to look at here is we have this assets folder. This is for static things like images or videos. And right now it just has a favicon and like a little logo in there. You can add other files to this as well. Um, the next thing in here is the content folder. This is all your data structure for the site. And basically this is where you have uh, all your JSON files. So we have this different concept of content types. We just call them types. And uh, right now the default comes with pages and blogs, but you can also have single types. So for instance, this single type here is an index.json. Another single type that you might create, if, if you wanted um, a 404 page to have specific content, you could actually make a 404.json or any other single type that you want. And the only difference between these concepts really is that a single type is a one-off and a, a group type has uh, potentially multiple pages in here. Now, in each one of these types, you're gonna notice that there's a special name file, this underscore blueprint.json. This is basically going to tie into some of the CMS things I'm going to talk about later, uh, where you have structured fields uh, to, for your CMS. It also is gonna help with things like default content. So if you're using the, uh, the command line tool to build site scaffolding and create new uh, individual blog posts or pages or whatever you kind of type you have, you could use this to create the default for you. We're not gonna worry about too much right now. We're just going to look at these individual content pages, but we'll dive into that in a second. The other folder that we have at the top level here is called layout. And this has some subfolders that all contain Svelte files. So these are basically the templates or the structure for your site. And I try to break them up in logical uh, groupings, but you can really configure these in different ways if you want. They don't have to be exactly these. Now components are basically reusable components that can be added to pages to create things. The content folder is a special name folder. So this content folder corresponds to this content folder here. So for each item in this content folder, you actually have a type. So we have, we have blog and pages and index, right? So we have blog, pages and index. And anywhere where you have something in this content folder without a type, basically you're saying, I want an end node for this, but I don't have any data that's coming from it. So I basically want to hard code anything here. So for instance, we have a hard coded uh, 404 page that you can see here. Now you could add a single type here, a 404.json, and then use replacement patterns in this, and that would work as well. But that's getting a little bit deeper than I wanna go at this moment. So we have this content folder that corresponds to our pages. And basically every individual node here in your content folder is a individual page. And then these templates will be the structure for those. Then you also have some global things here like your wrapper HTML, you know, maybe your head section with your metadata, your footers and things like that. And then you have a little helper scripts in here if you want to do special things and you don't want to clutter up your individual component file, like you want to have some logic in the background that works. Um, so you have that as well. And then we have our default node modules, which are just our NPM packages and um, a git ignore file, our package.json, which is for NPM and our plenty.json file. So let's actually just take a look at what we have out of the box here. Let me see, I'm going to open up a terminal inside this project here and I'm going to plenty serve is the command to get this going. And you'll see that that builds, um, that builds a public uh, folder here. You can name that whatever you want. There's actually flags to change the port that it runs on. There's flags to change the build uh, that it goes to, but by default, you're going to build a public folder 
and it's going to be on port 3000. So let me just open this in a browser and we'll take a look at what that looks like. Okay. So this is your default starter. It's, you know, it just looks like this. Uh, there are some, there's some information about what's going on in the site. There are some blog posts that you can click into. There's a, an about page, a content page. And you'll notice here that it's all a single page app here. So we're not reloading, but you actually have some routing out of the box that works. And every one of these pages has an HTML fallback. So you can actually reload the page and you should get a pretty fast um, first, first piece of content because it's all static and then it just rehydrates as um, things load. And then at the bottom of each one of these pages, you'll notice that uh, I tried to outline what template is being used here. So you can copy this if you want. So this page is being generated by layout content pages. And if we were to go back to our project here and I could do a control P to search for that, I could just paste that in there and then go to that page and I can see the code that's generating um, that information. So this template here is generating this page and this page. So these are actually being generated by the same template and they're being fed off two different content sources in this pages folder here, about and contact. Um, now we could add something to one of these if we want to. So we could add, for instance, a fake link here and we'll just say fake, uh, maybe fake page. And we'll say that this is a broken link. Okay. And I'll save that. When you save it, it's watching your file. So it should automatically rebuild your site. And then you can go back over here and reload your page and you should be able to see your new information. So we have this broken link and you'll notice if I click on it, it should handle 404 for us out of the box. Um, so you don't have to really worry about that too much. And yeah, so that's basically how you can modify a template. Now let's take a look at adding some new content to our project here. Um, I got to move this little, uh, zoom widget so I can see what I'm doing. Okay. I'm going to create a new terminal window here. And basically there's some helpers to create new scaffolding in your project. So if we want to create a new type, so right now we have uh, blog pages and in index, but we could say plenty new type and we could call it uh, event if we want uh, or events. Let's call it events. So when you create that, you'll see that it automatically creates this new folder with a blueprint.json and it gives us a new events.svelte file in here. And if we want to create a content source, I could add a new file inside the events folder and I could call this event one, one.json typing in the dark is a little difficult. And then you're in your JSON file. You can basically describe or define any type of content structure that you want. So you're not, uh, there's no defined fields that you need. You don't need to have a title or a body field or anything like that. You could call it whatever you want. We could call this any, and we could say, this is the first event. And so now we have a content structure. And if I were to save this, you'll see one thing's happening down here. So let me reload this. So basically I'm just, um, I'm basically at the bottom here in the footer, I'm just pulling in every single node, uh, which is not something you'd really want to do in a production site, but just for examples here, you'll see that this new event one has been adding. If I were to click into it, there'd be nothing there because we haven't defined any structure for it. So I can come back over here to my event.svelte uh, file here, and I could just create a new structure. So I could say, let's pull in that variable. So script, you create a script tag in Svelte, and then in the way you reference a variable, you do export let. And in this case, we named our key any, so we can just call that any. And then we could essentially just add a, uh, any kind of markup here. Let's add an H1 and let's pull in the any variable here. And save that, come back here, reload our site. Oops, I think it's building. Okay, so you see the, the title that we put in there. This is the first event. Now, obviously you could come through here and you could update this and add as many different keys as you want. We could call this the body, say this is some info and save that, come back. Oops, I hope I didn't just stop the sharing there. Oh no, coming back, okay. Um, and then you can come back over here and obviously add more information here like this and make sure you bring in that variable called body 
and put the body here as well. So this is probably pretty similar to people what people are familiar with with other static site generators, whether you've used Jekyll or Hugo or something like that. Uh, you can you can pull in variables from your data source. Has a lot more maybe a lot more flexibility than you used to. We don't really care so much about uh, unstructured like mark markdown fields or anything like that at this point. We're really more interested in the structured JSON fields. And um, but it's that easy to basically define whatever content source you want and then pull it into your templates and get going. Um, let me just show a couple other concepts here and then I'll just move on to kind of the future of where we think we're going with plenty and, and look at questions. But let me uh, come here and look at something here. So we have these, this concept here of writable stores. I think I maybe have an example here in the index file. Mm, no, it's in a blog post. Okay. So let's take a look at what this might look like. If I were to go home here, we have this blog post called Svelte Writable Stores example. And you have this idea here where you can add a counter and you can go down, you can go up. Uh, we could even add a reset or something like that. But basically how this working is in our blog post, uh, we're pulling in a couple components. So we're pulling in this incrementer and decrementer component here. And those live in this component folder here. You can see that I've defined them here. And um, if we were to look at these components as well, let me uh, keep this open. You can see that we're pulling from this store script here to get the count. So if I go to my scripts folder and I look at stores, we're basically pulling in this writable store from the Svelte core and we're signing a count variable to zero. And then we're using this incrementer and decrementer to basically um, pull this up. And these, even though these are different components, they're aware of the state of each other and they can keep that variable uh, in sync so you can uh, basically have those all separated out. Um, so hopefully that's an easy way to, to manage stores for very simple use cases for folks. Um, that example is right in the starter if you want to take a look at that. Another example that I tried to put in the starter here is this concept of uh, dynamic components. And so if you go to your index file here, and if I were to open up in index.json, oh no, I should keep that open. Okay. I'm going to keep this file open. I'm going to open up the corresponding template. So. Our index data source here has some keys. So we have a title, we have an intro with a slogan and some help text. And then we have this, com this section called components, which we just call it, you can call it whatever you want. We call it components. Again, everything in here is flexible. And in the component, I named what component I'm referencing here. So this template, and you can see in my components, I have a component here called template. And then I'm passing a little bit of data. So I'm passing index. And then over here in the index.svelte file, at the bottom we're saying, if we have any components, because we might not have any defined or we might have lots to find, let's um, go through each of those components. And then let's use this helper here. Let's use this load component helper that we're pulling in up here from one of our um, scripts. So if you want to take a look at that, let me keep this open. And let me open this up. So you can see what we're doing here. Uh, basically just creating a promise for this component. And then, uh, what we're doing is um, basically just using a dynamic Svelte component to pull in whatever component we have there. So you'll notice here that although we're referencing this template component over here in our content source, we're never actually going up here and importing that template component. It's doing it through this dynamic reference here. And what you see is at the bottom of the home page, we have this component that we're pulling in dynamically. Now, to show a little example, we could create a new component and pull it in as well. So um, let's create a new component over here in our um, index.json. Let's just call this uh, um, big text. I think that's probably the easiest thing to, the easiest thing to do. So, uh, whoops, I'm doing this a little wrong. Let's just say we want a component because that's how I define the API. You can define this however you want, and we'll say our components big text. And um, we have some fields for our big text component. Let's see here, fields. And our fields will just say has a value of, uh, we'll say text, why not? And we'll say this is the text. Okay, so we've defined that. 
data structure. We don't actually have a component called big text. We're gonna have to come and add one. So let's come over here. Let's add a new file. We'll call this big text. Whoops. Add a new file, big text dot spelt. Okay. And um, let's add a script here, script tag, and we'll say we want to export let, I think we called the information text. And let's, again, let's just do an H1 here. And we'll put that variable in there. We'll call it text. And then let's just style this really big. So in order to style our component, we add a style tag. And then it's scoped specifically to this H1, so we don't have to worry about scoping. And we'll just say that this is 10 uh, font size is 10 rem. That should make it rather large, and I'll save that. Okay, so what should happen here, assuming I didn't break anything, is our index is coming in here. It's looking for any components in our content source. It's gonna find that template component. It's also going to now find our big text component, and it's gonna dynamically pull it in even though we didn't really import it into this. So let's take a look here and see if we can get that working. And okay, so this is big text. Okay, so that works. That's basically how dynamic components work. It's a little long-winded. Hopefully people are, are with me on this, and hopefully that gives you a really quick overview of how to do certain things in this project. Now, there's a ton more you can do. Um, I'm always happy to, to answer any questions. Feel free to, to reach out to me or ask them after um, the rest of the presentation, but um, I'm active in the GitHub issue queue, so if folks wanna add questions or suggestions in there, I'm always open to that, so please do. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Gotta move this. So that basically covers where we're at today and where are we going in the future? Well, there's a lot of things we wanna do. So there's some small enhancements in the issue queue already, and this is just a, a small subset of those, but adding base URL. So we need a way to basically allow you to do subdomains or serve your site off subfolders, which is often common in things like Git, GitLab pages or GitHub pages. Uh, it might be like your username and then the repository name. And right now it just expects to be an absolute URL. So that's gonna break some things. So I wanna add that functionality. I also wanna add some concurrent build steps. So I think we can make things a lot faster, even though it's pretty quick as it is, I think we could really build this up to the point um, where it, it makes the next thing I'm going to discuss uh, really practical. And I really want it to be down in like the, the tens of milliseconds range um, for at least a, a very small site. And then things like default content, um, extending that blueprint.json file that I showed you that sits inside the types, uh, that's gonna tie into the CMS I'm gonna discuss, but also it's just uh, gonna help with like generating new pages and things like that. So you don't have to manually type things over and over again. Because assume, assuming that you made a blog post and blog post, for instance, has a date, an author, a title, a body, an image, and all these different fields. If you're creating that hundreds and hundreds of times, the odds are you're not gonna wanna add those keys every time. Uh, you might want that just to have a scaffolding to create some of them. So if you're interested in these or other issues, that's our issue queue. Feel free to go there, like I said. And then another big thing that's on the docket, which is something I really wanna move my attention to sooner rather than later, is themes. So a lot of static site generators have this concept of themes, and I just wanna discuss a little bit about how, how we're gonna to try to set things up here. So the structure of a theme is basically, it's another plenty site that's nested within a site. So there's going to be a folder called themes, and then that's basically going to house another plenty site. So basically, if you found someone's site and they've open sourced it and gave you permission to use it, and you want it as a starting point for your own site, you could basically put that into the theme section of your own site. And then that would have potentially templates, potentially content, potentially configuration files. And you could just run it completely off that theme if you don't wanna add any of your own stuff, or you could override those by putting any of those same name files in a higher level. So a template in a higher level will override a, a parent template. Um, content in a higher level will override uh, parent content, et cetera. And then, so getting updates is something that's challenging in themes. A lot of themes will do things like git submodules. So they'll they'll do a git clone into a themes folder. And then that, that theme will be uh, managed by its own git repository. Now, this is challenging because oftentimes people don't realize that they're pushing, they're not pushing the code from those themes. And sometimes they'll have problems when they push to production. So I actually wanna build an interface for actually managing some of this um, in the project so you can actually still pull from GitHub URLs and things like that, um, but not worry about uh, 
having to, to worry about submodules and things. So there'll be more about that in the issue queue if people are interested. I, just, I already talked about template inheritance. That's uh, overriding templates at higher levels. CLI commands. So I want to be able to add themes at several different levels. So one is when you're creating a new site, it'd be nice to start from just a theme. So you would do something like we did in the beginning, plenty new site, name of your site, and then hyphen hyphen theme equals, and then with the syntax we use to pull a theme in. And that way you would basically start from a bare repository instead of adding a starter. It would, it would know that you're pulling a theme, start you with a bare repository and put that theme in the correct place. The other place is adding it to an existing site. So when you've already created a site, you could go into your site and do plenty new theme and add it that way as well. And then options, I think it's important that once this is working, that I or anybody who's interested, probably me, um, create some different options for like starter themes uh, that are generic that people can play around with and get going and just see how themes work in general. Um, so creating a couple options I think is important once uh, the, the groundwork has been laid there. And then the next big thing that we really are focusing on is we want to lower the barriers to providing a get back CMS out of the box. So if folks have used Netlify CMS or Tina CMS, those are kind of the, the examples that we're, we're trying to build off of. Those projects are really cool and they use this interesting model, which I've actually described. I hope it's on the next slide here. Okay, perfect. So this is kind of the model that these um, projects use. So let's start at the top of this diagram here with GitLab pages. Now, GitLab is not specific to this. This could easily be GitHub or Bitbucket or some other project, but I like GitLab. It's a great open source project, so I'm just using that as an example. But essentially, you can host your website for free on GitLab pages. And then from that interface, you could have a front end, uh, Tina and um, Netlify CMS use React, but you can have a React front end that basically makes your website a, an editable form that you can change content on. So that's over here in this next step on the right, it becomes an editable form. And then that form interacts with an API on the repository where it actually puts pull requests or merge requests, but the, the nomenclature depends on the project that you're using, but um, it basically commits your code back to that repository in this step down here. And when that repository sees changes, it kicks off a new continuous integration or continuous delivery process. So that will basically rebuild your site, do any tests that you have, and then deploy it back to GitHub pages or GitLab pages. And this continuous cycle will allow for non-technical content editors to maintain a site. And um, it's a really low cost, low maintenance way to have a CMS. You don't have to worry about servers, databases, caching, or any of those other things. So it just kind of works seamlessly. Now, in order to get this to work, we need two important things, which is what I had aimed to set up in the very beginning. It's those fast builds on the back end. That's why we chose Go. And then those reactive front ends, which is why we chose Svelte, basically, you want to be able to preview your content as you're changing it and have the interactability with the APIs. So those two projects have set us up to, to implement something like this. It's just going to be a little bit of work to actually go and pull some of this in. Now, yeah, so this goes to, to why the CMS is practical. So again, the, the speeds, the builds must be fast. The reactivity, you need to be able to preview things and interact with components in uh, dynamic ways, even when you're editing them. And then also the data. So this is a big point that I think the other projects, which I think are really cool, um, they're, they're decoupled from any framework, which is definitely powerful and, and opens them up to a larger market because they can be used on Gatsby or Next.js or, or whatever project you really want. Um, but tying the data closely to the, the content structure that's being used by the CMS and uh, the static site generator, I'm, I'm hoping is going to cut out a lot of duplicate work. So oftentimes, when you're pulling in these decoupled um, solutions and you're just you're you're integrating them together, uh, if you're not first of all, if you're not using React on the front end, you're going to have to recreate your components twice. You're going to have to create your components in, uh, for instance, in Hugo, you have a Go templating language. You have to recreate those in React in order to get a preview to actually see what these things look like uh, instead of just a rough approximation of uh, what they are. And then you also have to often recreate the data structure to show how it ties into your own content structure. I think those things should all pull off the same. Uh, underlying um, uh, API basically. And that way uh, it should make this work a little more seamlessly out of the box. And although I never expect it to be as feature rich as some of these other things, I think that it will be easier for a lot of people. And I'm hoping it just gets people on this experience, which, are, which I really think is the future for a lot of this Jamstack stuff. Um, at least it, it, what I'm interested in on the small size project that I often take on. And um, I, I think that something like this will be a bridge for folks to at least understand it because I, I still think that the get back CMS in general is something that maybe a lot of people aren't even aware of, although that, that is definitely changing. 
Okay, and then the other question I just want to pose to people is like, what kind of microservices are interesting to folks? So um, I was thinking that once you have this general idea set up, having you know submittable forms is probably something that's really important and maybe low hanging fruit, but I think commerce is really important to folks. I know people care about search and, and other things. So I'm just curious what people think are the most important aspects to be able to integrate. And then, you know, is the best approach that we integrate with existing solutions and make the integration really easy and plenty? Or do we build eventually, and this is way down the road because we have so much to do on the, the fundamental project, but do we build some things in ourselves that integrate nice and easy um, and are just uh, simplified versions of these projects? So if people have any ideas on that, let me know. And then if anybody was interested in this based on the talk and they want to help the project, there's lots of ways to help out. Obviously, you can go on, on GitHub where the project's hosted and you can open issues or submit pull requests. That's always great. Um, but really the biggest thing you can do if you're interested in the project and you want to increase some of our motivation is just go to the project and, and start the repo. It's a, it's a free thing to do. We really appreciate it. It definitely motivates me to keep working on it and also just kind of signifies the community that the project has some sort of steam or some sort of attention to it. So if you like it uh, and you want to help the project out, definitely uh, we'd appreciate if you would think about going to the project and just giving it a star. And that's basically it. So uh, I don't know if any questions have come in. I'm happy to answer anything or just open up the discussion. If people want to just talk about Jamstack in general, that's always cool too. Uh, and I really appreciate you letting me talk and, and come on. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, appreciate you giving the talk. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, uh, quick thanks and, and uh, shout out there for the for GitLab. I actually work on the source code part of GitLab. So oh, cool. uh, MRs and all that stuff. So if you use GitLab regularly, you're I do. using my code, yeah. which, yeah. Hey, good job. Yeah, no, GitLab's a, yeah. a great a great company, great project. So thank you for your work. Thanks. That's great. Yeah, well, thank you. We're trying to make it better. Um, so, you know, a lot of the tech that you talked about is really cool. And, and, and I think it seems like, it seems like you've got some really fast things, right? Like it goes really fast, Svelte is really fast. Um, have you ever done any like um, performance comparisons between like, okay, I'm gonna build this app in Plenty and this app in some React framework or something. And like seen the orders of magnitude difference, whatever, do you have those kind of stats available? Mm. So are you talking like on the, the front end of what the, the client uses versus, or anything. Yes, all yeah. of the above. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's some some of the recent stuff has come up like Gatsby build times yeah. are really slow sometimes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Thirty minutes talking, yeah. and 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 so obviously you know your one sec or half second compile is going to be is going to be way faster. I'm just kind of interested in all that stuff. You know, sure. increasing the dev time, increasing the client time, all that stuff. Yeah, I think just I want to preface it with a couple things. So one is I have a huge bias because I'm I'm tied into one project more than others. Um, the other is a lot of the stuff is not scientific and it's not, I haven't done a lot of things. It's just kind of my opinion. So take that with a grain of salt, but um, I've noticed a couple of things. So um, with, with Gatsby, so I have a couple production sites in Gatsby and Gatsby's great, but even on small apps, Gatsby is, um, for me, is excruciatingly slow. And that might be because I, I don't know everything about Gatsby and there probably are simple ways that I could speed up a lot of those things. So that's one caveat. Also, I think, it seems like a lot of times um, it's, and I, I totally support this actually, and I'm, I'm not, I don't think this is a, a negative thing, but I think they're steering you towards some of their ecosystem that allows them to make money to make these improvements, which I think is great because it helps them keep the, the project alive and they have a staff and a whole group behind it, which I think they're they're doing all the right stuff and I really um, applaud them for, for, for everything they've done. But I think oftentimes that you you kind of have to be plugged into the things to, to make things a lot faster, like their, their concurrent, or, um, what do they call it, incremental builds and, and things like that. But I might be wrong about that. I don't know a ton. Um, so I think Plenty is faster for some of those basic things. Now, there's a couple more caveats. Um, one is I ha I honestly haven't really done much Plenty production work. It's so, it's so new and it's really just done with test projects that tend to be extremely, extremely small and experimental. So it's like, comparing apples to oranges, like as Plenty expands and, and, and gets used in production and bigger things, um, will those performance benefits at, at least, you know, um, be decreased? Will, will, will they become closer? Yes, I'm sure they will. So some of those things might kind of um, uh, not be as profound as I think they are at the moment. Uh, it's hard to tell. The other thing is if you were to compare the, the client experience that people are getting on the front end right now between Gatsby and Plenty, I, I'm, I would be 
shocked if Gatsby didn't blow Plenty away in, in so many ways, right? Like they, just just because Plenty is so new, not that Plenty can't ever catch up, but like Gatsby's doing lots of things like in image optimization and tons of code splitting, interesting things. And they're they're doing so much and they have so many smart people working on that. And um, Plenty is so new and trying to figure things out. Like we have some, we have some bugs that really just still need to, to, to be shaken out. And I, I, I'm totally aware of those and I'm not going to be shy about the fact that we have those. Um, so uh, I, I would think that in terms of like what's your lighthouse going to be lighthouse score going to be with Gatsby out of the box versus plenty. I, I haven't done a lot of testing, but I would, I'd be surprised if Gatsby slower than plenty. Um, although I think we could get the, with, I, if we put some performance uh, attention on it and uh, we, we did things better. And a lot of this is just like me using bad practices out of the box. Cause I haven't had time to really think about it, but I, I think we, I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't get to a better place, but um, right now, just since there hasn't been a lot of emphasis or time to do it, I would imagine that that Gatsby is faster in that regard. Yeah, cool. Um, I had another question. Oh yeah, was, you know, you mentioned that a lot of the work that you've done with Plenty um, is based on your own work with like smaller medium sites and you know the stuff you've used Plenty for is, is smaller stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know anything about. Uh, I guess felt in, in particular, maybe go a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that Plenty will will work with like? let's say a, a huge data set, you know, maybe I'm trying to render, you know, 10,000 rows and mm -hmm. I want a, a, a big graphical chart and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. do, do you think that the technologies that you've incorporated here are going to do that well? And how will that fit into your sort of um, ecosystem in Plenty? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, there's a couple of things. So there's, th there's some graphs um, that you could probably see online. So there's a theoretical inflection point with um, Svelte versus something like React. So React has a virtual DOM and, and Plenty doesn't actually have that concept, right? So if you have a small number of components and there's been a lot of arguments from the Svelte community that that number is not as small as you might think it is, it's actually pretty large, but um, theoretically Svelte is going to be faster because it's shipping less code to the browser than React's going to be out of the box, right? But at some point, based on how they're doing it, I guess there's a theoretical limit where those things cross and in very large sites, React would probably uh, have better performance than Svelte would. So, um, but then, you know, you have the maintainer of Svelte and some other people arguing that that theoretical limit never gets reached or whatever. But, um, you know, I don't honestly, I don't know enough to, to really say it's one way or another, but um, that, that's kind of the, the thing that I've seen out there is, as a convention was happening. Now, in terms of like really interesting interactive stuff, I think the cool thing about Svelte is it's being used in production all the time by its creator. So Rich Harris works for the New York Times and does a lot of interesting things. So I, I don't know if you actually saw uh, you know, the New York Times did this thing on, on Trump's taxes recently. And there's a bunch of uh, graphs that are really intricate and pretty amazing. So if you, if anyone watching this has a chance to take a look, just look up uh, New York Times Trump taxes or something like that. And you'll see these really great interactive graphs. I actually looked at it on my mobile phone and it was still blowing me away. And Rich, Rich actually created that with Svelte. So he implements a lot of the stuff in production um, uh, with, with Svelte all the time. And there's some of like, like really complicated, in, intricate graphs and, and um, dynamic things. So I think Svelte is really good at handling those things of performance. And also if you look at some of his talks, so I don't know if it was um, uh, the Rethinking Reactivity or one of those other talks, there's a lot of interesting cases where yeah, he shows you know, different um, frameworks doing like animations and things and how Svelte is actually smoother and faster in a lot of ways. So I think um, for, for a lot of cases, you're not going to be super limited by Svelte in terms of nice performance. They also have a lot of built-in animations and things that make, um, you can actually give the perception that things are a lot smoother than um, other frameworks can without adding a library or doing a, a lot of work to do it. So um, I don't think that that would be a, a, a negative to Svelte at all, but um, of course, honestly, I, I'm new to, to all this stuff. So I'm, I'm doing this project and on one hand, like I, uh, you could argue I'm, maybe I'm the worst person to embark on something like this because I didn't know anything really about Go or that much about Svelte when I started this. And I'm still learning, but I, uh, I, I really like, I, I'm simple in what I want to accomplish. I, most of my work, most of my day-to-day -day work is small um, sites that I have to manage lots of. And I found that like, um, I came from the CMS background, like I mentioned earlier, and uh, I find that like a, a really good developer can maybe manage six Drupal sites simultaneously, but I'm thinking... Uh, with Jamstack in general, a good developer can manage potentially hundreds of sites. It's it's such a different way of looking at things. Um, so I'm hoping that I just want to contribute to that ecosystem. I'm hoping that this even lowers the barriers even more for uh, new people getting into tech. 
because I don't know, I have no idea how people on, on ramp into tech these days anymore because it's, it's like the cliff is so steep that even doing simple things is like you're learning dozens of technology, you're cobbling them together. And uh, I personally would be confused if I was stepping into it for the first time today. So I think lowering those barriers is, is good for all around. And I also think people that are in my shoes who are just trying to either run a freelancing gig or, or whatever, and they need, they need to be, they need to be more productive because you basically have to price yourself lower than your competition because you're small and uh, y your whole thing is turning things around and, and being better in certain ways. And if you have tools that give you an advantage to doing that, I think it's like, you know, one of the only chances you have to be competitive in, in that kind of marketplace based on my experience at least. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, sure. I just wanted to, wanted to give you uh, some props. You said maybe you're the wrong person because you didn't know anything about Go or Spell going into this. I think, I think that it's really important to have people who aren't already embedded in these ecosystems to like build things with them sure. because you experience the hardships, you experience the problems and you build things that like maybe expand the boundaries. And so I think, I think it's, I, th I think you're the right person <laughs> to do that, you know? Well, um, well thank you. That's nice. I think, yeah. Uh, I think Zach might have some questions for us. Yes. We got a couple here. Uh, so the first one's from a AJC web dev. Uh, he first asked, uh, wait, let me see the start. Uh, I'm wondering if you've looked at other Svelte meta frameworks such as Sapper or Elder. I believe Sapper is a server-side rendering like Next slash Nux, and Elder is also a static site generator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a little bit. So yeah, so when when uh, when I started my project, I was like the f not that there's other people. There was like um, um, Sean uh, Swix uh, uh, doing a lot of Svelte static site stuff, and there's a bunch of people that are playing around with that, and I was actually taking ideas from, there's a group of people on, oh man, I think Svelvet was a project. Um, and actually someone opened an issue on their thing, like, hey, we're all trying to do the same thing. So everyone was commenting on it. It was really funny. We kind of, uh, and, and everyone was being a good sport about it, helping each other out. But um, so there's a couple people early on working on different things um, in this space, the, this Svelte static site space, but no one had really figured out a way to get to market. And a lot of people were doing it um, Kind of begrudgingly, it seemed like they were just like, I don't want to do this. Just like someone has to do this. Like, can someone just take my ideas and just do this? Um, and so I think I was like one of the, f well, you never know when people kind of come up on the scenes. I, I consider first to market in terms of the fact that I was the the first besides Sapper to put my project on um, staticgen.com, which is like a Netlify service, which I, I don't know. They've actually recently, I think, reformed that whole site. But I was there was Sapper on there and then I was the only other Svelte project um, on there at the time. And then I've since seen, seen a bunch of people come along and far surpass me. And it's, a, it's a little disheartening, but it's, it's all, I'm also like really happy for those frameworks. But like a new, a bunch of new frameworks were being added, like Elder got added, looks really cool. I, I downloaded, I played with it a little bit, looks awesome. Uh, doing a, a bunch of like things like partial hydration and, and cool things like that. So that's definitely worth checking out. Um, there's, a, there's a few others, that were, they're, they're slipping my mind. Um, so elder and jungle. was, oh, jungle JS. Yes. Uh, sorry. So my, my girlfriend's sitting next to me, uh, jungle JS is another one that's doing a lot of, um, similar things. Uh, it seems really cool. And like both, the, both these projects seem like they have rocket ships on them. They're really taking off. So, uh, definitely take a look at those. I think we're taking slightly different approaches to how we're doing some of this stuff. It's just, um, uh, I, I think, uh, the, the introducing go and trying to build the V8 go stuff is definitely a unique aspect. And, for better or worse in some ways I think it might be better in some ways I think it might be worse but um, it's interesting to see everybody take their own take on it the reason that I created the first at the beginning if these other projects existed when I started uh, who knows if I would have started I'm not sure but um, the, at the time Sapper was really the only thing out there and I think Sapper is great in so many ways but it's uh, it kind of added uh, the static site generation side of it as almost like an afterthought it seemed like so they added this export functionality, which was really just kind of sluggish. And um, I mean, it was cool, but it just didn't seem like that was the focus of the project. I think the project really yeah. focused to be Next.js for Svelte. So at the time it made a lot of sense to build the project. And now I'm just in so deep that it's like, yeah, I can't go back now. Um, but I think there's there's a lot of cool things in the space doing it. I wish I could speak more to those other projects, but I have to play around with them a little more. I think they're definitely worth checking out if people are, are interested in this space. Yeah, definitely. I. I, this is the first time I've heard about Elder, so it's cool to see that Svelte's getting some more broader support in terms of that, because Sapper was the only one I knew about for the longest time. Yeah, um, I think Sapper's probably still the front runner in terms of like definitely attention in, in people, and and obviously yeah. Rich and those guys are um, they're they're developing that as part of like Svelte, so it's like really closely integrated. 
yeah they're like hand in hand yeah um so second question from uh ajc is uh if you wanted to connect plenty to a database is one recommended is it architected in a way where it would make more sense in a relational world versus a no uh, sql world yeah so um hmm i you you could it's not really set up to do that right now i'm thinking like you probably could with some work and some PRs force it to do that, but I'm not sure it would be great at doing that. So you, it's kind of like thinking like, should we make this more like full stacky versus jam stacky? I'm thinking um, the, the idea or the method behind it was to do kind of the, the flat file database. And that it, it's kind of like a, like a NoSQL, right? But it's really just, it's that, it's that content folder, right? It's a bunch of JSON files that live in a folder. Um, and then the, the CMS will write to that, that folder and write more content files. So that's basically your substitute for a database. It's just flat files that are JSON that are, in my opinion, easy to understand and then easy to pull into your project. My plan is to to stick with that and have that be the primary focus. So I'm not sure that, at least in the near term, I'm gonna think about hooking it up to a database. Although if someone's interested in that, I, I'm always happy to, if, if people like where the project is now and they're like, this is the way to go and you can convince me and also wanna put some work into it, I'm always open to it. But for now, I think the concept is going to be keeping things as flat filey as possible. Um, having that interaction where it's, you know, the, the Svelte front end, writing to the code repository, I'm gonna focus on GitLab probably primarily, and then GitHub as a secondary one. And then having that, that cycle back to write more flat files that then get built into the site is, is my focus. But um, if people have better ideas, let me know. I'm, I'm always open to it. Yeah, uh, I, I feel like one that comes to mind is Sanity because it, the way someone kind of put it to me is uh, it's essential you're interfacing with a database, but for content. So not necessarily with flat files, but I could see a way where maybe you manipulate that to, or have some sort of API to interface with it to pull in the JSON. Mm. Yeah, that's a good idea. I had there. That's a great idea, yeah. Um, so we got another question here from Gabriel. Uh, what kind of projects have people been using with Plenty so far? <laughs> um, well, I don't know if, I mean, I have some people who like reach out and they submit things, but I don't know if anyone's really honestly using Plenty in production at this point. I mean, there's, there's plenty.co, that's the website for the project. Um, and then there's a bunch of like little test sites and things that I've used, but it, it's honestly so new at this point that I don't know. If someone's using it in production, please let me know. I would be blown away. That'd be really uh, cool to see. Um, also, uh, like, I just curious, like, exactly what you're using it for. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's really being used in production at this point. For me, I really want to see the point where I'm going to start really kind of pushing into my own work is once I have the CMS integration done. Um, I think at that point, it'd be a lot more practical for me to, to be using, especially when I'm handing it off to non-technical clients. Um, so in the near future, I'm hoping that will happen more and more. And if someone is interested in using it in production, like, let me know. I'm interested to hear what's a holding you back or concerns you might have. And then, uh, I, I'd also be happy to have a, a transparent conversation about like what corners you need to see around. Cause I would, I would absolutely hate for someone to be like, this is hundred percent ready to go. And then they get there and they get stuck in a corner. Um, and we can right. mitigate that if we have the conversations up front. So I'm very open to conversations. Um, but I, I don't know if it's really being used that much in production at this point. It's so it's so young and so new at this point. Cool. Uh, well, I'm not seeing any more questions so far. So Thomas, unless you have any extra questions here. I don't think so. I uh, My brain is a little bit muddy after a, a long work day today, so I'm having trouble thinking. Um, Jim, thank you so much for, for presenting this. I think it looks really cool. And uh, I, you know, I went to plenty.co and the site is really fast um, and I can navigate around super fast. So that, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, that's a good, a, good, uh, a good point to you. So Great. thanks for coming by and, and sharing this. Great, thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and thanks for persevering through a storm. We were getting worried <laughs> yeah. of like, oh, oh, something <laughs> happened. Glad yeah. that we, yeah. we made it work, so. Yeah, I lost power a couple hours before signing on. I kept hoping it was gonna happen and then uh, it never did so yeah so i missed, missed your email about connecting here and i was i was actually feeling like like an extremely old man on twitch so i haven't used twitch before and i was like i was like kind of like the guy yelling at a computer like can you hear me like and obviously there's no way to, it was just it was crazy so uh, i'm glad i could hear you guys talking in the background about yeah, where, right, where am yeah. i and uh, we were able to connect yeah. that way so uh, sorry to make you sweat uh, it out a little bit so, yeah <laughs> 
Well, Don't if it worry. makes you feel any better, the candlelight is very romantic. Oh, so. okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice ambience. Yeah. Uh, all right. All right. Well. Thank you, everybody, for coming out, and uh, we'll see you next month for the next Jamstack Denver. Thank you, Jim. All right, thanks. See you all later. See you.